All right, so probably the biggest upheaval of this period in time is the beginning of the civil rights movement in the United States. The civil rights movement is perhaps most synonymous with the 1960s, but it actually gets its start really in the 1950s. However, its origins are much earlier than even that. At that time, the civil rights revolution came as a great surprise. Most white allies decim were decimated by McCarthyism, union leaders were unwilling to challenge racial inequality, and the NAACP was tied up in court battles. New leadership was needed, and southern black churches provided most of the organizing power. World War II represented a significant challenge to the Amer American racial system. Individuals like Jackie Robinson used their experience of the possibility of equality glimpsed in Europe as the base for their actions back home. We also see unprecedented migration of American, of black American citizens to northern cities where they were able to gain a political voice. The post-war global developments also contributed to the rise of this civil rights movement. The Cold War plays a significant part because how can the U.S. be the leader of the free world if we don't even have freedom at home? Decolonization movements around the world as well were also used as inspiration as colonized peoples in other places began to rise up and demand equality and independence. Well, segregation was a pervasive practice in 1950s America. Black Americans experienced poverty and various opportunity at a rate much higher than other ethnic groups within the nation. Roughly half of the nation's black families lived in poverty at this time. And segregation was widespread. We talked earlier about the suburbs, but the suburbia, while it was never quite as uniform as we are often led to believe. There were upper-class suburbs, working-class suburbs, industrial suburbs, and things all like that. But as late as the 1990s, nearly 90% of all suburban whites lived in communities with non-white populations of less than 1%. The main group that was excluded from the suburban movement were non-whites. During the post-war housing boom, federal agencies continued to insure mortgages that often barred resale of houses to non-white families, financing essentially housing segregation through the government. Even after the Supreme Court declared those practices as legally unenforceable, private developers and banks continued to bar non-whites from the suburbs and the government refused to subsidize their mortgages, except in segregated enclaves. At the same time that non-white families are being barred from the suburbs, under programs of urban renewal, cities are demolishing poor neighborhoods in city centers in order to build retail centers and all-white middle-income housing complexes. White residents displaced by urban renewal often moved to the suburbs, but non-white families were not able to do the same thing, and so they were forced to find housing in run-down city neighborhoods. Suburbanization hardened the racial lines of division in American life. Between 1950 and 1970, nearly 7 million whites left the cities for the suburbs. Meanwhile, nearly 3 million black Americans left the South for northern cities, increasing the size of urban ghettos and creating new ones. Roughly half a million Puerto Ricans as well also moved to the mainland when they were forced off their land by the expanding American sugar industry on the island. Racial exclusion also became self-reinforcing, with non-whites concentrating in manual and unskilled jobs, often resulting from employment and education discrimination, and trapped in urban ghettos. These ghettos were seen by many whites as places of crime, poverty, and welfare. In the South, you also have the hardening of Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow loomed large with segregation creating a legal barrier to opportunity in this area of the country. In the North and West, segregation was not necessarily required by law, but often in place by custom, as black citizens were barred from colleges, hotels, restaurants, and most suburban housing. 
Hotels and casinos did not admit black Hotels and casinos did not allow black employees except in the most menial of occupations, and black entertainers who played casinos often found that they were not welcome to stay in the same places where they performed. These are the conditions that most black Americans find themselves in in this period of the 1950s. We are, however, going to see some serious legal challenges to segregation. In fact, this is the first place where we'll get any real action. 17 states had laws that required racial segregation in public schools and several others allowed districts to impose it. The Eisenhower administration was reluctant to confront the issue, and so ultimately it fell to the courts. The main actors in these battles in the courts were organizations like LULAC, which was a Latino organization. They brought the case Mendez versus Westminster in California, and in that decision, the California Supreme Court ordered schools in Orange County to be desegregated. The state legislature then repealed laws that required segregation, and the governor signed the law into effect. That governor was Earl Warren, who was later chosen as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and led one of the most progressive courts in American history. Of course, another key player was the NAACP. In 1938, the NAACP brought suit against the University of Missouri Law School, and in that case, the Supreme Court of the United States ordered them to admit a black student because there was no such school for black students inside that state, thus violating the separate but equal part of the Plessy versus Ferguson ruling. In 1950, a case was brought against the University of Texas Law School, again on similar grounds, and again the Supreme Court ordered the admission of the student, him and Suet, because while the school had established a school, in quotes for him, it was hardly equal. There were three classrooms in a basement and no library. Perhaps the biggest victory, though, in the courts, particularly where it comes to education, because this affects education at all levels, was the case of Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka. This case was brought by the NAACP in support of a number of local cases where black parents were challenging unfair school policies. It was not necessarily a direct challenge to segregation generally, but the unequal funding of schools. When the cases were united, they were listed alphabetically, hence Brown was the first name and the main one that we would recognize today. The NAACP made their argument before the Supreme Court directly challenging the entire doctrine of separate but equal. The emphasis was on the stigmatization and the subversive effect on the self-esteem of black students. The argument being that segregation itself is inherently unequal, so there is no possible way to actually have separate but equal. By this point, Earl Warren was appointed as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and the desegregation decision came from a unanimous court. Segregation in public education, it was decided, violated the equal protection under the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. This decision was, of course, extremely important, but it also had its limitations. The court order did not order the immediate implementation, but instead called for hearings as to how to dismantle segregated schools and advocated for a more gentle, slow desegregation. However, this decision is, of course, significant because it marks the emergence of the Warren Court as an active agent of social change, and it is, of course, the first real attempt we have at dismantling the entire idea of segregation. Now, this applies chiefly to education, and in order to bring these ideas, the notion of segregation being inherently unequal and the equal application of the law under the 14th Amendment, we're going to have to do more work in that case, and so we'll look a little bit more at those actions in our next lecture. <laughs>